give this I need. I know Becca is doing some majority leader work and will be in shortly. Oh, somebody's going to get green paper, whoever you send it. And would you like to send it again on white paper? That's okay. 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 I'll send the next one on everything. I won't do anything until you do that. I don't have something too much information. I don't have a pickup truck, this is all I got. Okay. Thanks. Well, Sheila, why don't you come up to the comfortable seat? And we'll get started. Did you text them that we're starting? I didn't. I and you? I did announce it five minutes ago on the floor. Yeah. Okay. And we actually do have a, a break schedule in here today because of scheduling with most of Tom Quebec. Too bad I can't leave. Because I've heard that three times. Okay, so we're going to start. This is the um, exposure to radio frequency, usually known as 5G report. I don't think we asked for it. In one of the health committees, or did we ask for this report? We asked for it. We asked, we asked for, for it. it. Okay, we did. Yeah. Okay, Act 79. Act 79. All right, so we are going to start. So, hello everyone, my name is Shayla Livingston. I am a policy advisor at the Department of Health. And what I'm going to do today is walk you through the report that we submitted to you on January 1st. Um, and then of course take questions. Um, if at any point I don't have an answer to your question, I will uh, be sure to write it down and get back to you. There are many, many different people at the health department contributed to this report. Is that what you're looking for today? Yes. I'm going to make sure. Great. That's good. Um, so the health department went through recent literature um, and studies and regulations in order to compile this. So I want to be very clear that we did not do any of our own research. We do not do research at the Department of Health. Um, but we compiled the information from the scientific um, body of literature that exists already. The request for the report was to look into a radio frequency radiation generally and then also to look at, at, at 5G being a, the most recent iteration um, of the, the cellular network that will theoretically become available. And I think we asked you to do a similar report when we were doing smart meters. Correct. Now, so years ago. Okay. That is correct. And that is exactly what I was going to say, which is that there is even more information in the previous report is looking for additional background information. We completed a smart meters like very similar to, to this. Um, previously, I think it was about five or five years ago. <clears throat> so I'll start by saying when you're thinking about radio frequency radiation, um, there it is a spectrum and um, radio waves like that that you get on your and I've done radio or on one end, end and then gamma rays are, are way on the other. And if you're looking at the report um, on page four, you can sort of see that as you go higher from radio waves up towards gamma rays, the waves get smaller. Along that, you've got microwaves, you have infrared radiation, uh, you have visible light, and then you have x-rays. So um, this is going to be important as we start to talk about the difference between 2G, 3G, and 5G. And what is interesting is as, as you go up the Gs, <laughs> um, the wavelengths change. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that um, as I begin talking. So I'm going to start out talking generally about radio frequency radiation. The only consistently proven negative health effect from radio frequency radiation is, is heat and heating. So much like you heat your food in a microwave using radio frequency radiation, um, the types of radio frequency radiation we are exposed to are much lower level, so we're not going to heat it like your food in the microwave, but it's a similar concept. And this is the people who are most at risk for this are individuals who work um, in the field, so they're close to transmitters, and that's what um, the FCC 
designates regulations about how close you can get and what kind of protections you need if you're going to be very close to one of these really high powered transmitters, your, your skin, your tissue can actually be heated by the radio frequency and potentially burn. And so that is the only proven, well-known, well-established health implication. And that is what the FCC regulations um, address in currently. So Moving on. Cancer yes. from our, our exposure has been extensively studied in, in lab and epidemiological studies. And um, the results from these studies do provide some evidence that RFR is associated with cancers in animals and humans. Um, but more studies are needed, essentially, to understand how that works. So right now, there is not a known biological mechanism for how that would actually happen. <coughs> Um, and so that's a really important part of us understanding how anything would cause a cancer is having a plausible biological mechanism. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit deeper um, in a few minutes. 5G wireless is different from other RFR in that it does not penetrate the human skin. Um, so it's potentially different than 2G and 3G. And uh, if you read about 5G, one of the issues is that there's going to need to be more transmitters. And the reason for that is that 5G does not penetrate walls or buildings and similarly does not penetrate the human body. So again, this is it's a slightly different technology. It's going to behave slightly differently. Okay, so um, we were looking at smart meters. The concern was the rays would penetrate into the house into people's living space. Mm -hmm. 5G is, a, is different than that. It, it won't penetrate through the walls of your house. So, so 5G is different. I'm not gonna say it won't penetrate the walls, but it does not do that as well. Okay. So 2G does that to a much greater extent, for example, okay. than, than 5G, 5G would. Okay. Um, but we know it does not actually penetrate human skin. So I think from the health, and I'm going to talk about the structural elements because I know that less, but from but the health perspective, this is going to be important. Your part. cell phone can penetrate. I mean, that was the other, if we keep talking mm -hmm. on our cell phones, it would cause brain cancer. This so, is a, a better. Can't say better. No, it's, it's different. different. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so the, the, Federal Communications Commission is the entity that regulates the um, occupational health is really where we're most concerned right now about exposure. They regulate occupational health requirements and they just recently actually, while we were writing this report, reaffirmed their um, permissible exposure limits and that was on December 4th of 2019. So they just put out a report saying from their perspective, from the available evidence that their current um, limits are still good enough to protect human health. So I just want to put that out there for folks. Um, so I'm going to get into a little bit more of the, the science and the background. Unless the committee wants, I'm going to sort of move on from thermal effects. Uh, and we'll hear more questions from the questions. committee. Okay. All right. Well, sorry, man. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, again, and I thought this for a few minutes later. So again, just to reiterate the five. There are some uh, radio frequencies or other things on the electromagnetic spectrum that people are using today that do penetrate the skin. Yeah. And five G just. So I'm moving on right now. If you're following along in the report, I'm on page five. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about more about the carcinogenic, clinical carcinogenic effects. Um, Another question. Oh, sorry, sorry yeah, go on. Senator Campion now sparks a question for me. So um, it doesn't penetrate the skin. Can I assume, like, how do we expect, how does the technology work inside a building or a car where everybody's using their mobile phone? Does it come through the window? Or what is the, clearly the, <laughs> Okay, you're going to go outside my area of expertise really quickly, yeah. but all I can tell you, Senator, is I know that they need many more um, transmitters then. So it's a very different setup 
than what we are used to right now. So with 3G and 4G, you have the towers, you have these big transmitters. And with 5G, my understanding is that there will need to be, it's more like wireless. Yes. I, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking about it more like wireless. That much I got. That. But that yes. still doesn't solve, if, if it doesn't penetrate in the same way that the bigger technology does, how do we, there, there is a way that this technology works inside a building, clearly. Yep. So yeah, I think it does. I mean, I think it does penetrate to some extent. And again, I don't want to speak to the. Yeah, we may need. We can have somebody I can from just the tell industry you come in and tell us. the body. I can just tell you that part of it. I don't know exactly what that is. Sorry. Um, so, in when you're doing um, research with carcinogens, there's two very large categories, and I'm sure you all know this. But there's the the laboratory studies of the animals. Um, and then there's epidemiological studies, so and that would be, you know, how public health normally does this type of work is to look at the human, you know, the, the epi study, so human behavior and then the human response. Um, but you, there are also toxicological studies that we look at um, when we are examining this type of, of issue and exposure. So based on the available evidence from 2G and 3G wireless telecommunication RFR, it is reasonable to conclude that, that high levels of RFR from cell phones could be harmful to humans um, when they're exposed for very long periods of time for their whole life. Um, and then also, sorry, one second. Um, but again, those studies have not been done for 5G. So we, we're not sure we can translate that or or tell you about 5G based on the And I also assume that we haven't exposed humans to high doses of RFR for long periods of time in their whole life. So, I mean, right, so, to be so you're getting to one of our, my points that I'm going to make, and let me just, I'm going to pull you all down a little bit um, into the appendices. Um, so I am now on page... Thank you, thank you. Sorry, folks. I am on page nine, bottom of page nine. Um, so the reason that toxicological studies are so important is that no, no, um, no one would do that. No one would expose somebody to something that could be harmful to them for long periods of time. So um, when we, when the National Toxicological Program did this work. Um, with wireless, and again, I want to clarify, it was with 2G and 3G, so it was not with 5G. Um, they did find some evidence um, that it caused cancer. And they, it was a specific type of cancer and only for males. So if you, um, male, male, <laughs> get off the cell phone. Uh, <laughs> No comment? Okay, so <laughs> the NTP studies, they, when they classify their evidence, they have different categories of evidence, um, and they did find um, clear evidence of tumors in the hearts of male rats exposed to RFR, um, and then they found some evidence of tumors in the brains of male rats exposed to RFR. So I want to make clear that these rats were exposed for much longer periods of time um, and at much higher doses than most humans are exposed to. Um, and it's not clear from these studies, since it was only the male rats, why that would be. So we still do not have this biological plausibility reason um, for why it would only be males or why it would actually cause these cancers. Um, but. That said, they did find this evidence, and it is important to, to note that. We can, okay. When you say that they were exposed much more than humans, that's what she said. But even in places in Vermont where we struggle with cell service, you know, there are. How is that different? I guess if you're if you're walking around, you're not using your phone. Um, but your phone is in your pocket, it's sort of transmitting. So can you just help us understand that? I mean, is there a difference between being on your phone and having it on your body? Or is there a difference of not even having a phone and walking down the street when there's let's, cell towers or what? Sure. So let's scroll up a little bit. Sorry, I didn't do this to everyone. But page six, 
So we do, um, because there is this possibility of carcinogenic effects, there are recommendations for how you can reduce your exposure um, right now. And when, when you look at, at this, one really important thing to think about with radio frequency is that the distances between, the distance that it takes for something to um, be really intense and then to dissipate, obviously it depends on the transmitter and, and which transmitter that is, um, but if your cell phone is like pressed up against your head versus your cell phone on the table, that's actually a very important distinction for exposure. That changes depending on what we're talking about, but to your question for a cell phone specifically, if it's on the table, my level of exposure will be much lower than if it is press if I've got it, you know, like I do all the time, right? Put it to my ear like this, right? That's going to, to be a, a much higher level of exposure comparatively to it being literally a foot away on the table. Um, if you are looking to reduce your own personal exposure, there are ways to do that. Um, and obviously the main ones are to not be on the phone as much um, and to have it a little bit further away from your body to use headphones that connect to the phone. Um, to you turn off your, your wireless features when you're not using them, that includes Bluetooth. Um, and also to look at, at the cell phone that you have because there are cell phones that, that are lower uh, level emissions than others. So and does that answer your question? Okay. I think in terms of the, the levels that the rats were exposed to, no human would be exposed to that level. There's not a scenario where that's plausible. Unless there wasn't like some horrible work accident, but again, they wouldn't be exposed to it for their whole life that way. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. And the, but these studies again are all on the two G and three G, three G, which do penetrate skin. The five G does not, so we don't know at this point. Correct. It's probably too new to have done anything. Okay. Right. And so that's one of the things that we know in the report under the 5G section, which is on page five, is that, um, you know, in order to be able to tell you more, there needs to be more, more research on 5G specifically. Um, scrolling down a little bit, regulation, the report that was requested that we discuss the regulation. So again, um, RFR is regulated by the FCC, um, and they did just restate that their current levels are sufficient to protect human health. We note in our report that the two large bulletins that they have about biological health and health effects are fairly old and probably could use updating as well. So we, we link to those in case you're interested in those. That's all I have. Okay. So, reading the executive summary, the last bullet says the FCC regulations about permissible exposure to uh, are pre preempt state regulations of R. Does that mean if we had concerns, we'd be unable to do anything more than what the FCC is doing? So I'm going to look a little bit to the ledge council. I'll say ledge council's here. But maybe we will have, is that, Maria, is that? It's probably more Ellen. I can speak to okay. a little bit, but okay. this is something that came But I know that's what we've been told. In the federal yeah. preemption yeah. environmental effects. Right. That's my understanding, but that's definitely not my expertise. So okay. I'll pass that on. I know that's what. I've been told every time we've asked in here is that this, we cannot ban it, we cannot regulate it, like, or limit it, I guess, limit it. There's, there are potential types of regulation, but with respect to siting. Okay. We can do siting. Under Title 47, there is a specific preemption related to the preemptive states from regulating based on the environmental effects. And my understanding is, is if you try to regulate using your authority to do siting, but if the underlying purpose was a health issue, that would be preempted. 
That's my thing. So it's been a while since I've looked at this. Okay. But I will. But that has Confirm. been my understanding whenever I've asked, because this is not the first time that this concern has come up. Uh, I know with smart meters was the last major kind of expansion that we looked at. Um, we were told the same thing, that we really don't have ability to stop it or limit it or do much of anything except advise people how to limit their exposure. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it would seem that something that doesn't penetrate your skin, other than if you get too close, you'll get burnt, or too much, you might get burnt, is, is very different. It could potentially behave yeah. differently. Yeah. Right. I and don't know. We don't know that for that. No, but that's right. But it is a different. We can't just say this is more. Right, we can't extrapolate from one to the other. You got it. Okay. Yes, a question. Yeah. Uh, the evidence that you, you're referring to here largely uh, refers to things like cell phone coverage, the, the, uh, the bands that are the 3G and 4G bands. And have you, is there any study that you're aware of that has found any adverse effect of 5G? So in our um, little section on 5G, the only five, again, the body of literature is very small, so I want to be clear about that. Um, but the studies that do exist did find um, just that this technology does not penetrate the skin and that the only known health effects in those studies were from excessive heating of the eyes, so the skin right around the eyes. <laughs> And were there a lot of studies that attempted to find out whether 5G is, represents a health risk? No. There have not been enough studies in this point. Yeah. Does any jurisdiction done. ban 5G? I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Are there different levels of 5G? I prefer like low, mid, high. Right, right. Right. So right, that's a level of nuance that we're definitely not able to speak to yet. But you're right, there are different, it is not like 4G where there's just one type. It, there are different, I, there's a technical term that I'm not remembering, grades or levels. Do they have different it. health effects that's potentially or they're all the same? No, no. We don't know. 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 Well, probably aren't a whole lot of studies. We have all the time chemicals. We're <laughs> <laughs> in such a litigious society that I mean, we think of companies. Yeah, isn't yeah. Welcome to America. Yeah. Yeah. Make your money and then face the lawsuits later. Right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Right. Watch your uh, watch your flat fire retardants in your furniture. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions for Shayla? It's really helpful. It is. Yeah. Very helpful. Sorry, we couldn't be more. No, I think, <laughs> you know, so we, we asked because the concern came up. I think the hard thing is even if you came in and said, you know, it's, it's uh, going to cause everybody's head to balloon up, like, uh, yeah, that there's very little we can do about it, that this is this federal this is federal domain. Um, so we're going to. We have, we are permitted, as Ramey says, not for health reasons, but to regulate siting. Yes. And the technology depends on loads more right. sites than currently. What? That's right. On sites. many, many, many more, more sites. sites. So that is an interesting mm -hmm. and I'm, interplay. I mean, yeah. No, but and you I certainly think, can't use that as a fig leaf to deal with the health issue. Right. I mean, yeah, yes, right yeah. Right. But I and I checked this last year because the concern was that infrastructure was going up and it could just be turned on and there would be no public input or knowledge or discussion. And when I asked, I don't know if it was the 
Public Service Board, uh, the Public Service Department, but when I asked, I was told, you've got something on a pole, but in order to do 5G, you need a box on the ground, and that would require a siting permit. You can't just go and say, I've got a permit to hang a 4G or a 2G up there, and I can just switch that out for five, and it's, it's the same. That there is actual something that needs to go and would need a public hearing. So people will be aware when something is going in. And because it needs so many, I think we've also heard that Chittenden County will probably be the one place that it will hit. Um, it might hit some of the larger cities like Montpelier. Or, um, so Chittenden County mails. Yes, you all yeah. can. <laughs> but I can sell you some prime real estate in Washington County. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe you covered this up. Sorry, I was a couple minutes late. But I have traveled a little bit since we last had this conversation and noticed 5GE on my, it'll pop up on my phone. And I've kind of assumed that, because I think you need a new phone to use 5G. But uh, do you have any sense of what that is? Is that just a marketing thing? Or? I don't know. It, it's always been big, big cities, like not right. big Vermont cities, but real cities. Um, and uh, I'm assuming they're just getting ready. Maybe they can tell us. I think time. we're creating the desire for it. So when it comes, 5G ready. Yeah, we'll be ready. Okay. So if you have a 4G phone, you wouldn't have to worry about it. Okay, committee. We've got some downtime, so I've got a couple things. We never confirmed the uh, tax commission. Someone asked about a background check. I did get a letter back from the tax department and they said, as a matter of course, they do not do background checks. Okay. Thank you for checking that. But we did check it. Yeah. But in this case, thank you for reading it. This is the governor's appointment. It is his responsibility. We have, we, approve. <laughs> we have no reason. This man has worked in Vermont in the tax department for something like 20 years. So, um, before everybody leaves, Senator Campion, I would like to do that. The other thing, um, we have all the studies, and I've got one. Two, okay, I've got two, three reports that people, well, that one's got four. I'll give you one with X's. Yeah, you got X's. I think the only thing I'm seeing that has nothing on it is the last report. Uh, I'll go over these closely, which is the report on resources made available for the Vermont Enterprise Fund. I is think still around. You wanted that? No, I said, is that still around? Is there money in the still? I have no idea. I don't even know what it is. Is the one that's still? I won't say how I'll portray it. But it was, it was uh, Governor Shumble. It rhymes with shush. <laughs> All right. So that report. No I, that's what I thought. It might have spent on me. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, well, maybe we, we should we find, find out report. where that report is and find out if there's any money. <laughs> and what that sounds like it might hit your committee more than mine. So do you want to find out if there's any money in it, and then we'll tell them to cancel the report. Uh, okay, I'll find out. I, I think there's. I can't believe there's any money left, but I'll ask. If there's any money less left. Like, it's like eight years ago, ten years ago. And they gave most of it to IDA. Okay. All right. All right. 
right now I was remembering coming, it's coming back. back. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we should. Like four of them have left. Yes. <laughs> Everybody's. Fine. All right. I've got all but one of you. Um, I could get a motion to appoint. Uh, confirm. All right, I've got a motion to confirm Craig Bolio as the Commissioner of Taxes from December 18, 2019 to February 28, 2021, or until his successor is reported. Have further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. I'm going to hold that open for Senator Brock since he was the one that asked for the background check information. <laughs> and he was here when we started, but I'll let him vote because I'd like to get him in this. Or if he wants to just say he wasn't here, that's good. Do you report it? Um, that's a commissioner, so I do it. And I will do it. So we do not have another witness until 2.45 because Tom Cabet is in high demand. I might take it. This will be my third time going through the revenue, so maybe I'll get you on. One committee after another. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Um, Welcome. Both the first two committees ran late, and I tried to shock catch up, but we'll watch. Anyway, so everybody has a copy of this. Yeah. Um, this is not an a earth-shaking forecast. This is uh, a modest mid-course correction. Uh, when you add up all the, all the three funds that are involved, you get about $23 million more million than we expected in July. So it's not, it's about 1%. Uh, a lot of it's just technical uh, adjustments based on new taxes, some of these e-commerce taxes, the vaping tax, and things like that. Uh, now that we have actual receipts, we have a, you know, some hard data, and revise and adjust the numbers, and, and when you add it all up, that's the, the net effect of, of what you get. So, um, who are you? Pardon? <laughs> I said, who are you? Oh, yeah. I think we need you just to introduce oh, yourself. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Tom Cabat, State Economist. You just swept right in. Well, I got this message. You guys are waiting. He's just so wound up here. He's been doing this all day. I've been doing this all day. And I got this, this message in the last few years. Senate Finance is waiting. He's getting down there. He's got a green visor. Yeah. It's just right. a yeah. really good down. It's true, though, that you get different numbers to each committee. Yes, I do. And see if they remember that. And then if they do, I'll know that who's, who's questioning. Just give us the real numbers. So that's all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you tell me what numbers you want. <laughs> see what we can that's do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, <laughs> I must say, I just want to do a QA. So, you know, is there anything in this or, uh, uh, you know, that you want to get into in more depth? The, the presentations, you know, in the emergency board are pretty superficial, just broad brush, and there are issues that you sometimes are contending with that are much more granular, and, and uh, there might be revenue issues that uh, you'd want to get into. Uh, we just got this sort of, yeah, well, I'm sorry, I'm give you some last time, but I had a question about the huge tax. Do you know anything about um, any structural changes with short-term rentals? I know we did the Airbnb contract where they collected, but we were supposed to be doing that for uh, the VRBO, the, the next biggest. But we also passed a law, and I don't know whether it made that contract with VRBO unnecessary or not, but I don't know whether uh, they're collecting that large sum of taxes and paying it over directly to the state, or homeowners are still individually supposed to pay it. No, uh, so Airbnb had been remitting, collecting uh, uh, for a while. Uh, as of September, we started getting HomeAway and Yeah, 
Right. Well, actually, they're, they're two, but they're, all, they're both on live feed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then Expedia is reporting separately for travel agency related revenues, yeah, that will not short term homestays. So we didn't so have to go. sign a contract with Homeland of Europe. The law took care of that. The law took care of that. And now we're getting one check from each of those entities for all their. Yeah, so the home away includes the VRBO, and then Expedia does a separate one for right. the, um, you know, for their uh, online travel agency work, and and then Airbnbs. And is that on target from what we forecasted? No, uh, the the Airbnb and the homestay part is is uh, has been great, very solid and <coughs> growing phenomenal. So that's good. The estimates that were made, and again, it's very hard for tax or joint fiscal to make estimates for things that haven't really been taxed before. And, you know, so they use other states things and all the rest, but that turned out to be a lot lower than uh, expected. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the travel agency fees are just a part. So the hotels, they're making reservations. The hotels have always been remitting themselves mm -hmm. for, for that. So Expedia is not remitting that part of it. It's just their part of the profit for the travel yeah, agency. I guess I was more interested in the uh, short-term rentals on the VRBO platform. The, you know, so we only have a quarter of data since they came in in September. Okay. And even Airbnb took a long time to kind of ramp up. If you looked at the early numbers, it was, you know, there's like this extraordinary growth. Well, it wasn't that they were growing at that rate as they were starting to comply at that rate. And so I'm not sure if we're into sort of complete compliance covering everything uh, or if, and if it is, that would, I would say it's on the low side, but you know, but uh, I think we have to give it more time. Yeah. Um, and that was supposed to start in July, but as I understood, there, there was some issue and it was a negotiated start date. Uh, that they ended up with. But going forward, we'll be getting that revenue. And it's, uh, boy, it's been, the e-commerce revenue in sales and use and in meals and rooms has been phenomenal. It's, it's really a big chunk, and it's growing at incredible rates. And, and we can break it out now with tax, the way tax uh, generates the information so we can really understand it. Um, but that's been that's been impressive. The the sales and use numbers, you know, we've had Amazon, but with the Wayfair decision, we're getting almost 1,900 new vendors that we got as part of that. And even though there's a handful that are paying most of it, that's still it's a, a, a lot's coming in and and. You can tell that early on there wasn't 100 percent compliance because it, it's also ramping up, and uh, it's just a it's a big it's a big chunk of money, and you know had been out of the tax base. That was why sales and use have been growing so slowly before. So that's that's been important to have. Um, yeah, what are the new taxes? Oh, the 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 best you know or, or the worst good revenue news we have is the vaping tax uh, turns out to be about four times the size of uh, the market that, that had been expected. So, you know, that gives you an idea of the public health issue. Uh, but, you know, there's $3 million instead of $800,000 in revenue that we'll probably get from it. So, uh, it's, it's, it's too bad, but anyway, that's uh, that, that's part of the health care uh, fund mm -hmm. section that got a little bit of a bump. Uh, so that just makes it harder for us to ban them, right? Well, well I mean, us. On, on the one hand, yeah, harder. On the other hand, even more imperative that, right. so. you know, because when you think of the public health costs and the, the health lifetime costs of the poor folks that are... Right. Yeah, tied to that. It's just, yeah. Anyway, it, uh, it's quite a market. Um, how, how much of that? Uh, you know, we also banned internet sales of vapes. So, do some of the uh, 
you know, the fact that it came in strong, we thought some of it might have to do with that. Now that they have to buy a little for Yeah, but that was part of the yeah. estimate. It's just that nobody knew how big that market was, and yeah. there was no real way to find out. So there were other states that we looked at and things like that, but it wasn't like Jewel has given us their marketing data. So um, it, it was, um, yeah, it, it wasn't all clumped in one month. It was spread pretty evenly. Uh, there were only five of the six months that had reporting in the first half. It started, you know, but that's, that's not unusual when mm -hmm. tax effective. Uh, so, yeah, it seemed to be spread pretty evenly. It didn't look like there was some inventory bump or something that was happening. Didn't go down when kids started dying. It didn't go down when kids started dying. That's the nature that's, of an addictive product. Yeah, that is. My definition. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, do you have a question? I, yeah, but I would, no, go ahead. Let's do Q and A as it comes up because that's kind of more interesting. He needs to break it up after doing this all day. Right? Well, but I just think it's more interesting. <laughs> you know, more grown up. I can talk forever about all this yeah. stuff, but I want to know what you're interested in and what things you're, mm -hmm. you know, intending. I get sort of two parter here. Um, the first one was it's the rate of the disparity between. Those Vermont uh, um, earners and, um, between the top and the bottom growing, continuing to grow, and if so, whether it's a faster or a slower rate than it used to be. Um, and we had some testimony yesterday that we generated another question um, after you've answered the first one. Um, we, don't, we don't have uh, real good data on you know, distributional uh, stuff, but the strength of the personal income tax receipts is reflective of the fact that, that, that there's a, a preponderance of money that's going to higher income, higher bracket, tax bracket earners, and so we're getting more tax revenue from that. So that's a big part of why there's still growth there. I mean, you, you, have a, you have a tax source that, you know, if you look at the peak earning age demographically, uh, like maybe age 47 to 61, when you have peak AGI, and we look at when did Vermont have the most of those of that cohort, it was 2010. Since then, we have 22,000 fewer of that age cohort. Since 2010, personal income receipts have gone up 80%. So almost $400 million. You know, part of that growth is just income growth. Part of that is more income landing where it's more, where there's a higher marginal tax rate. And uh, so everything we know nationally about income being, distribution being skewed is likely to be present here. There's, they're not clear good state metrics on that, but we've been working with tax to try to develop some stuff, just looking at income tax distributions because it's important to, to in understanding the forecast of it to be able to do that. So I hope we have some more hard data. Yeah. Second question on, on those lines. We had some testimony yesterday from David our I apologize, I don't remember his last, his last name. He came in yesterday He's from JFO, and he was explaining to us um, what he was seeing coming from pass through uh, income tax payers. Maybe Graham? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And the question that was asked yesterday are more people, um, see, since the, the 2017 tax changes, where which people are changing their behaviors to take advantage of the Things like uh, yeah. pass throughs or yeah. not taking advantage. Yeah. And are we are we losing income because of these new opportunities and they're switching lanes? Yeah. Now the jury's still out on we're we're in the dark still on that. We don't we don't have data on that. And it's 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 really uh, you know there are reasons to and not to do these things and. So the models that they use assume rationality that this always occur. We're just going to have to look at the tax data after it comes in to be able to sort it out. 
but um, there's nothing new on that. There's nothing more on that I can add. Uh, Graham ran some stuff through Chainbridge, and that's using maybe 2016 data, something like that, to try to estimate stuff. But um, I think for those that experienced a, a tax increase as a result of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, there will be efforts to try to minimize that. And if that's one way you can do it, that will be done. But uh, when we seek to set policy in the collection of taxes, which changes are taking place sort of in front of our very eyes, but we don't know what they are, how, do, how can you help us um, not get farther and farther behind the analysis and the report? Well, as soon as there are data that are clear, you know, we put them in. So something like, you know, the vaping thing, we got pretty good clarity early on, but whether that stays or whether that, you know, I mean, it's, it's just we've got to be plugged in and we're asking tax the same question. So as the filings come in and get compiled and we can start to assess that, um, we'll be doing so. Uh, but it's not always real time. It just seems to impact the things like baby, baby or small and easier to get a yeah, no, no. on and where the real action is taking place. Yeah, it's sort of swirling about. Well, the e-commerce is big. That's that's another one that's you know more like a forty million dollar thing than and the disparity of incomes. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. More than my share of the time. Cheers. Okay. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah. Um, um, go ahead. And can I ask about the unemployment? Metrics on our own here. Uh, four. Um, you know, we've been leading the pack here, but I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about sort of so called real unemployment, mm -hmm. which is whatever. I, I guess, can you comment on that? And to your understanding, if we were looking at chronically unemployed and, and metrics that make up real unemployment, would the shape be roughly the same? Um, in, in other words, is it the same relative for other states or any, any kind of that? So there, there are six measures of unemployment, as you probably know. And the one that's headline reported every month is, is, this one. is called U3. So the six ones are creatively U1, 2, U2, U3, U4, U5, and U6. And U3 is the one that's reported on monthly. And that's the one that's kind of most commonly, you know, compared and all the rest. Uh, not all the measures have been collected over the same length of time. So almost everything's been collected since 1994, but some go back to 1947. You know. The um, the all of the unemployment rates have come down. So the so the ones above U3 include. Uh, less <coughs> employable people, so people that are marginally attached to the labor force, people who have been out of work longer, or people that have given up on looking for work, people that are underemployed, that have a part-time job, or would like a full-time job. So those are, you know, that, that's what those broader metrics are designed to capture. In December, the, the, the broadest U6 rate was 6.7 percent. And so, so that's, you know, about double the 3.5 percent U3 rate, but that's the lowest recording ever posted for that. So it's come down, just like the other the other employment yeah, rates are 50 year low. Mm -hmm. They track pretty closely. Um, Vermont's, you know, has the lowest U3 unemployment rate. It also has the lowest rate for several of the other uh, unemployment measures. That the measurements at the state level for the alternative measurements are not as accurate. So you usually do like maybe three quarter grouping so that you have enough observations to you know to make sense of it. As a, it's a pretty noisy series, but um, the Vermont's lowest in the country at about maybe four of the six 
uh, categories, but it's uh, but I don't think U6 was one of them. It's like maybe fourth or fifth or something like that. Um, but it but they do tend to move in in sync, and rates across the board are historically low. Doesn't mean they're zero, but historically, yeah. yeah. What what's remarkable about what's happening in the labor markets to me is not. You know, I mean, the record unemployment is, is remarkable. But the chart on page six shows that even with labor markets this tight, there's no meaningful wage growth. Yeah. So, yeah, so this speaks to your question. But it also underscores the extraordinary lack of power that labor has in the workplace today. A uh, combination of, you know, this memory of this terrible recession where a lot of people lost their jobs and people are just happy to have any job and they don't want to lose it and, you know, so there's, there's that kind of sense. A lot more service jobs, way less unionization. Uh, I, you know, all these things contribute to uh, a powerlessness that exists. The employers are you know, have relatively a, a lot more power and are just not using wage to try to, to you know, if you really need a worker, you could, you could offer a higher wage to somebody. They'll do all sorts of things. Even if it's a hiring bonus, it's like a short-term thing, but then the wage isn't, it doesn't stick to you. You're gonna, you'll get the employee with a bonus, but then you're still paying a lower wage. So wages have been sticky. This, this chart here shows uh, nominal wages in red and real wages in blue here. So, you know, that had been going up, as you might expect, as labor markets tightened. In February, we had 3.4% nominal wage growth. That was that's the highest it's gotten in this cycle. You know, that was about 2% real after adjusted for inflation. But that's dropped to under 3%. In, in December, it was 2.9%. And that is the equivalent of a 0.6% real wage change. So that's just extraordinary when you have these kinds of unemployment rates, and you've had them for that long, you know, they've been fairly persistent, mm -hmm. to have so little demand and power okay. to affect that. I don't control reading this chart. Okay, so nominal. I understand the nominal, but okay. the blue is the real wage growth in each month? Yeah, so year over year cha percent change. Year over year. Right. So December 2019 versus December 2018. Okay, so I mean, there must be a figure from, eight, from June 11th to October 19th as to what the actual, the nominal growth in wages and the inflationary adjusted growth and wages over that eight-year period? Well, each one of those is a month, right? So each little tick. So the, that arrow points to this point here, which is the peak, is plus 3.4%. Right. So wages in February were 3.4% higher than they had the year before. Right. That's, you know, and then when you adjust for inflation, that's a little under 2%. Right, so I understand. So this goes month by month. And yeah. you can see but then they've been dropping. Growth. But is there, a, is there a chart that shows cumulative growth over that whole period of time in wages, both nominal and? No, I can, I can run those. How do, you, how do you, just at gut level, is it keeping pace with inflation at least? Well, to the extent this blue line is above zero, it's keeping place with inflation. Okay. But in a tight labor market, yeah. you would expect to see real growth, not just okay. keeping pace with inflation. And, just, and even and back in, you left in, two, in the first few months, it was losing ground to inflation, right? And the first few months, no, it wasn't losing ground. So the first, first few months over here. Oh, well, yeah, 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 back here. This is uh, 2011. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, there have been periods where it did, even though you know, the nominal wage here was, you know, flat. Right. That's right after the recession. So again, that's that's, that's just that's after but the this worst. Is particularly recession. shocking because of the tight labor market. Yeah, the fact that we're clear out here now 
at a time of really low, un low unemployment rates, you'd start, you would expect to see real wage gains right. up to maybe even two and a half percent. Mm -hmm. And that's just not happening. Not only has it, it, it it's, it's not growing much, it's actually the rate of change has slowed a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that was surprising. You know, we had done some work looking at, at, uh, at New Hampshire as uh, part of some minimum wage stuff, and we were looking at who in New Hampshire was earning less than the Vermont minimum wage. Because we thought, you know, even with a 725 minimum wage, you can't hire anybody for 725. So who's actually making, you know, shows up this summer making $8 and $9 an hour. So what are the characteristics? That there was heavily female, an older female, you know, was the, so, so part of it too is that workers aren't raising their hand and saying, I'm worth $10 an hour, I'm worth $15 an hour, and I'm not gonna work unless I get that, or you know, I'm gonna you know, bounce around to different jobs and trying to get, you know, there's, um, yeah, so the, the, the problem though is that there's, there, without some kind of collective action, workers don't have a lot of, a lot of strength, comparative strength. And, um, and also when the expectation of inflation is fairly low, and it is for the most part, um, there's also not quite as much pressure thinking, you know, that whatever I'm making now is gonna erode quite as fast. Yeah, I need a raise, yeah. But it's just remarkable to me. I mean, there certainly are professions and sectors that are getting bigger wage jumps, but it's just remarkable overall that they're so, <coughs> so stagnant um, in this market. And so Tom, can you remember another time in <coughs> years ago when, when the graph has looked like this one, and when unemployment has been so low and we're not seeing a concomitant rise in, in wages? When was the last time you saw? Well, unemployment has not been this low for a very long yeah. time. So at the U.S. So level, 50, 50 years. 50 years. Yeah. Wow. So that's really going back. Um, uh, but then, you know, you had more inflation and you had, right. you know, more, more wage growth, uh, much higher levels of unionization right. in 1969. Sure. And, you know, so, um, yeah, so that's, that's notable um, mm -hmm. just in terms of uh, markets. Um, any other questions? Yeah. That, that's well, is, is that, um, I'm wondering if there's a parallel, I mean, in 69, for instance, we didn't have income inequality anywhere near the scale we have today. Yeah. Do you expect, does historic periods of high income inequality match with low unemployment and low wage growth? I mean, is that sort of... A You'd have to go back to the twenties and yeah. times like that to like try to find That's something comparable. I'm just curious. Data yeah, probably would, but I well, could, but we did have extreme economic disparity between men and women, and we still do. So, well, so we'll I just want to just want to make sure that we. Well, we're all yeah. impacted by it. And, yes. And then we have an extra layer. Sure. So, yeah. There's an interesting stat in December. It was only the second time in history on record that there were more women working than men. So uh, the December payroll in, uh, jobs number was uh, higher for women. There are 145,000 jobs added in December, 139,000 women of those. So, in the country? Yeah, nationally, yeah, right, right. Yeah, we have really got a number of uh, yeah. set us for a decade. Uh, but the only other time that happened was right in the early phases of this last recession when construction, manufacturing, and all these more male-oriented industries dropped fastest. And so women just briefly had more. But this is now at the end of a pretty long period of sustained growth, which just means the sectors that have been growing fastest are service sectors mm -hmm. where women tend to dominate. But I but think- don't tend to be highly paid. But they'll tend to be highly paid and they're not highly organized. Exactly. So are more, maybe more complacent in terms of accepting uh, uh, salary levels and pay levels and things like that. So. 
dominator, the intended dominator be relegated to? What's that? When you say the, the oh, sectors, yeah, dominate the sectors, the or dominate. could be, be relegated to. Um, yeah, I mean, healthcare, uh, education, uh, I mean, you know, for whatever reasons, they just are, they tend to, yeah, they tend to be more highly employed in those areas, but they're, they're outnumbering men, and that's what's unusual, yeah. Yeah. So, so what's gotten us to this point of, of low unemployment across the country? Just tell us, I mean, sort of basic economic, economic growth for a long period of time. It's the longest extension. So, so what's behind that? Why is the economy growing yeah, so yeah, long? Yeah. Um, uh, good public policy. Mm -hmm. So no policy mistakes uh -huh. Where? at the federal uh -huh. level. That's the most important one. Um, population growth. Um, you know, all the. Mostly through immigration. Well, it doesn't matter. Population growth. Yeah, yeah. population growth uh, nationally. Um, you know, a good business environment, a good, you know, rule of law society, a lot of innovation, and. Um, uh, a lot of global trade. So that, you know, so when you have a sustained 126 months, or yeah, of expansion, yeah. Uh, sure. you gradually right. start using everybody in the yeah. labor force. You don't have a recession, you have no, you know, correction. And um, so, you know, you're reaching full employment. Which is a good thing for an economy. Yeah. And actually, yeah. the things that would have put the economy in recession, you know, as we were looking at the at the world in July, and there's this risk matrix thing that you know was on page 13. Uh, you know, that just sort of looks at all the factors that could affect uh, you know the recession. The the two things that were leading to recession, uh, or that were most problematic about recession, was a year ago the Federal Reserve was raising interest rates. A year ago this time. They've been raising interest rates steadily, mm -hmm. and they were expected to raise them well into the new year. Mm -hmm. And that was a policy mistake. That was, that was too aggressive and not, you know, again, not reading the current situation, kind of using historical data, thinking that, the, that, you know, that, that they needed to be tighter. Um, so that was, that was one. And the second thing, the second highest risk was the escalation of the trade wars. So the trade wars were, it was a pure policy decision. It wasn't anything, mm -hmm. any imbalance in the economy or right, right. right. policy decision. So the Fed turned around mm -hmm. and it's revived real estate markets, mm -hmm. property transfer tax revenue has mm -hmm. benefited from that, home prices have increased more. So that was clearly, you know, a move and the direction, you know, they moved in the right direction. The trade wars, just the tariffs that were put on, probably cost a half a percentage point in real GDP growth in, in uh, uh, 2019, and about 450,000 jobs. So that was also, in terms of economic performance, a policy mistake. But the fact that there's a phase one trade deal, right, tariffs aren't removed, but at least they're backing down, um, you know, means that probably won't get any worse, and that's not something that's likely to tip the economy into recession. There are a few things that have gotten worse, but they're not in the quadrant of sort of most impact and highest okay. risk. So, you know, corporate debt, rising corporate debt is, is one. The what stock personal <coughs> debt. What personal debt's good. Household, that? household balance sheets are in really good shape. So there's right. been, um, in part, a lot of the folks that were most exposed in the last downturn or mm -hmm. cut out of credit markets. And mm -hmm. that has other impacts. Sure. But in terms of household balance sheets, that's not bad. Corporate balance sheets, though, you know, debt's cheap. And whether the rating agencies are doing a good job this time around with assessing corporate debt, I don't know. There's a lot of it that's junk rated, and so that's showing up, but maybe more should be. 
uh, there's a lot of it, and that's just the concern is that um, um, you know, have to plow down. But in general, the, 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 the worst risks, the things that are all kind of over here, mm -hmm. all the arrows are pointing down. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's why recovery could continue. There's nothing that says it has to stop. Uh, a certain period. Yeah, a certain period. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And there's a chart in here about other countries. You know, Even though it's in the sort of the American psyche. That it's in the American there. psyche, but if you look a little beyond America, yeah. you see like, uh, you know, Australia. <coughs> and, uh, me, what's that? The page number is... Australia, page number 10. There are three countries that have, that are, that are currently in expansions that are longer than the United States. And uh, two of them are more than twice as long. So Australia and South Korea are, all, are currently in expansions, page 10, uh, that are, that are uh, double the length of the United States currently. Uh, now, it helped Australia that China is a you know, source of huge demand and right nearby. Uh, but um, uh, and 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 during this last downturn, China was the least impacted country in the world, and so they kept buying from Australia, and that you know that helped the whole region. Uh, but there's but there's no reason that the recovery has to end just because it's 126 months old and yeah. it's a record. Also, the fact that it's been growing at really slow rates. It's really looking where there are imbalances that can't keep going, mm -hmm. or is there some external shock that you know might be coming that we should be prepared for? That's harder to guess. The one thing we added to it, speaking of external shocks, uh, from July was significant military conflict is out there on the. Uh, edge, uh, you know, just came into consciousness with sure. the Iran thing, but um, that seems to have receded a bit. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Michael, you have one? We need to wrap it up. So, soon. Um, we hear a lot about this building about Vermont demographics. Is there anything in here or do you have an opinion on? Um, impact of uh, some of the challenges you're facing? Anything you hear about that? Uh, there's not something new on the demographic front. There's, there's new data out from the Census Bureau every year, so they make estimates between the decennial censuses, and the 2019 estimate wasn't great because they revised their way 2,000 people, the 2,000 person gain that they had estimated the year before. So, you know, it's basically the story, though, through the last decade is not, you know, whether it's a little bit above or a little bit below, it's basically flat. And uh, it's important to remember that when they do the real census, which is this year, there will be a much more definitive count and much more credible analysis around and, and detail around, you know, what's happening. Um, it sometimes, you know, there are sometimes surprises for the real count. We've had big shifts sometimes. They go through, by the end of nine years, they're estimating, estimating, estimating. They can get pretty far off. So we'll see when that comes out. But is there a rule of thumb in that it's good to have more people, or is it this could possibly be, be good to be flat out? There are pros and cons to it. I mean, on the one hand, if, um, I don't think a priori it's necessarily better to have more people. Um, it's sometimes harder to manage costs if you don't have growth, if there's an assumption there's growth. As long as you're managing your costs consistent with the population you have, you don't have a problem just because, by definition, there's slow growth. In fact, too much growth can be a real problem. Um, <coughs> You know, this, this is mentioned sometimes in climate refugee scenarios, but a lot of the Act 250 stuff was that there was, the feeling was there was too much growth happening in Vermont in the 70s, and, and it was like kind of out of control, and this wasn't so good. Um, it's hard to, to sh downshift because we have been used to regular increases, 
and budgets went up in a regular way, and you know there was sort of this expectation of growth, and so sometimes it's hard when the growth stops to adjust. Um, but I don't think a priority that are people less happy if there's if there's less growth, not necessarily. You know if um, and we've seen tremendous income growth, uh, aggregate income growth. Not distributionally, you've got the same issues that exist, but um, <coughs> you know, it's. It, I mean, it is what it is. So the only thing you can change, given that the fertility rate, and that's the biggest part of it. You know, the, the if if we had been creating babies at the rates we were in the 19 early 1990s, this there'd be no issue whatsoever. But the drop in fertility rates is big, you know, it's big, you, you can't really influence that through public policy. And there, and there are real limits to the extent to which you can bend any of the economic fundamentals that affect migration. You, you know, you're not going to get it by little things around the edge. You can get little results. But, but the, uh, the, the big thing now would be when real estate markets recovered to the extent that selling a house can represent some kind of gain that then allows you to that, that, that will get in migration. Um, if, if we're as a tax policy committee, uh, what actions might, where should we be focusing our actions if we're trying to narrow this disparity um, between the top end and the bottom end? Um, and what, what should we, and at the same time I ask this question, we're going to have a, we're going to be proposed to us by the administration to do certain things. Yeah. And they signal that, uh, that uh, demographic uh, changes are a crisis. What should we be avoiding um, if someone asks us to do something, if our goal is to try and bring this disparity down and um, move the, the people at the bottom, actually, seek more of the benefits of the full employment. Well, well I, I think it's important to understand that there are limits to what can be done in the state. Within the limits, so what we that's, do. That's hard. I mean, there are programs like an earned income tax credit that really do, you know, stimulate and, and enhance earnings of low-income people and encourage work. Um, things like minimum wage changes the state's been uh, uh, good with that, that definitely, you know, affects, that, affects some distributional issues. Um, I, I think it's also important not to necessarily <coughs> waste money on things that aren't going to be terribly impactful. So if you're, you know, well, spending money to try to bribe people to come to the state just doesn't have, just is not going to have an impact. And, and you're, they're just many, it, it makes the state look desperate, not, you know, the, the He didn't mean bribe, he means encourage. Spend <laughs> money to do that. Yeah. I, it's, but it's just, I mean, those are sm relatively small amounts of money and they're capped. If you really wanted to, you know, if you thought that was effective, you'd have to spend enormous amounts of money. Okay. But the thing that gets people to move to the state are positive amenity values about the state. So the quality of life in the state is the thing that's most attractive, that most motivates people to come to the state. Not, you know, something little around the edges. Well, when you say quality of life, yeah. what issues do you uh, also include in that? Uh, benefits such as pay, family leave, a higher minimum wage, those kinds of things? I think those things, that for some people, make a difference. I don't think we got a huge onslaught of low-income people because there's a higher minimum wage, but quality of schools, uh, low crime rates, uh, healthy environment. Um, you know, when you look across professions and you look at wage differentials, um, you know, the highest wage differentials with Vermont versus the, the nation are not in low-income wage areas, but they're with you know, doctors and lawyers and things like that. And those are not people that, I mean, people that can live anywhere. 
and and the reason then that they choose to, to earn less and be here is well, related. Okay. Thing you mentioned we already have. Right. We have a little. You do have that. Yes. That's, yes. right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Why are we? Why, why are we well, you protect those, but I mean, you have a recession yeah. where if, if your house is underwater yeah. and you're living it's in Massachusetts, and we got a lot of migration from yeah. Massachusetts, you, you you're going to sell your house and turn your paper loss into a, a real loss, mm -hmm. and then have less money when you're, mm -hmm. you know, to, that that froze yeah. migratory flows in a way that mm -hmm. is just now being analyzed in academia. There's some excellent work by a demographer at the uh, uh, Carsey Institute at the University of New Hampshire, probably the best rural urban uh, uh, demography uh, uh, studies uh, that, that is focused on how this, this recession that was real estate centered uh, was critical in freezing migratory flows and is still not unthawed completely. And um, I think that has far more to do with it than, you know, than, than any of these other things. But that's outside of the control of, you know, okay. of, of what a state can, can I'm do. Gonna, I'm going to have to wrap yeah. this up anyway. because I'm told they're twiddling their thumbs okay. across okay. the so hall. Like the next, the next and one. I know Senator Pearson had a question I'll chase you out. he wanted to ask you. Yeah, and I'm happy to individually engage with folks and or come back sometime if there's I think as we work our way through this and I think yeah, yeah the demographics is definitely gonna be an issue. I know, I don't care what they we're we're being we're really good. Good. We're No, we're you. we have a room full of people. You can yeah, ask your right. questions. <laughs> but I'm okay, trying to move you. on so you want to hear at six o'clock. Madam Chair, thank you so much. Jim Tierney from the Department of Public Service. It's nice to be back again and I look forward to the next session. Hope everybody else had uh, some nice time off as well. Um, we have been very busy in all divisions of the department. Uh, just as a, um, a table center for you, everything I'm going to touch on are things that uh, would bear further uh, briefing if you have the time, and I would be happy to make that staff available to you because a lot of it can be very technical. I think we've uh, got other folks coming in giving us a more detailed I'm just going to touch on a lot yeah, exactly. into so, specific um, areas. Starting first in the Consumer Affairs and Public Information Division, uh, we are doing significant work on overhauling the residential disconnection rule, which uh, has not seen any love from uh, the regulatory world since 1983. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, since 1983, with uh, connectivity having it progress the way it has, uh, a lot of issues come out about uh, whether we can do dis disconnection remotely and the like. It's just one of many issues in that sphere, and the department's taking the lead on modernizing that rule. It has uh, big implications for uh, customers to uh, make sure that they uh, have good uh, practical interface with their regulators, and also for the utilities to save costs in uh, you know, rolling trucks to get out to people's places to disconnect when it's needed. Uh, we also completed the consolidated service so that's um, quality, uh, consolidated service, service quality investigation that we launched uh, about uh, I think a year ago. Uh, if you may recall from a variety of media reports, uh, Consolidated has uh, been delivering less than, um, than um, quality of service. Right. And so we undertook to um, have some disciplinary intervention at the, at the PUC. Um, the upshot of it was uh, we had advocated for a $5 bill credit per incident for every customer who experiences an outage as a way to create a serious incentive for Consolidated to fix its service quality problems. Uh, we lost that argument from the PUC. However, the PUC did uh, impose an alternate fine um, or a penalty, if you will, on the company and said you can either invest $150,000 in um, infrastructure upgrade and build out, or you can um, pay $120,000 to the general fund and leave penalty under 30 minutes and 30. I just highlight this point for the community because I think this is an area that in due course would bear some inquiry by the legislature. Uh, this has been a problem for many years uh, before the PUC and at the department. When the discipline is necessary under Title 30, 30 penalties, the fact that it goes to the general fund 
instead of going to uh, more directly to the consumers who are harmed by the outage, for instance, or bad behavior, I think is a is an issue that would be worthy of uh, looking twice at. Okay. So um, yeah, that was surprised we haven't been. Not yet, but I think uh, with that. Okay. I, I think that, I mean, that was my purpose in going through that investigation was to say, okay, can we get the PUC to order this five dollar bill credit because that's direct relief to people who've experienced yeah. an outage uh, or who've experienced bad conduct, and we've got a ruling now, and we understand the reason why they didn't do that. And so I think the next step is to either try to negotiate this as part of the incentive regulation plan for um, consolidated, or to come to you for legislative relief and kind of thing. Are you saying that the law? Prohibits it going back to customers, or it's just not been the practice. No, it, the, the law contemplates that when you impose a penalty under Title 30, that those monies will go to the general fund. The PUC has kind of danced around this for many decades and, and created a variety of mechanisms to sort of avoid the problem. But I think it's time to address it head on and get it fixed. If you folks agree with that, we also completed the WEC, the Washington Electric Co-op rate design uh, during this period. Uh, we had a very difficult position that we were taking in that case, and frankly, I had a lot of difficulty accepting it, but I thought it was the right thing to do in the end. Uh, WEC has inclining block rates, meaning uh, they, they have a, a signal in their rates that is designed to encourage efficiency, which is a good thing, and they've been doing that for decades. But we now are launching policies in the state that encourage electrification. We want people to use electricity and get away from fossil fuel. And that uh, rate design then becomes something of an obstacle in the service territory because people correctly perceive that if they're using more electricity for a car, for instance, an EV, then they're going to be paying that much more for electricity. So we brought this uh, argument to the PUC. They reviewed it. They ruled against us and said, uh, no, we're going to let WEC keep its inclining block rate and its rate design. I wouldn't sit here today and tell you that that's a bad thing necessarily because WEC has a high, very high number of low income customers. But it is a policy issue that needs to be addressed in due course. Because if you're going to be sending signals for people to use electricity, and you're saying that that's the way to go to get greenhouse gases down, then your rate design also needs to reflect that. And so some of these things are going to have to be worked out. In public advocacy, uh, we have stood up a system now for monitoring decommissioning. And I'm very proud to say that among the things that we've done, in addition to retaining experts who will help us with financial monitoring, of the decommissioning fund, we've also overhauled our website to make it more accessible to the public so that they can monitor our decommissioning in real time as we do. And also, we are aggregating information from the Agency of Natural Resources and the Department of Health as well to make it easier for people to follow up to have one stop shopping, so to speak. In the planning division, I'm very proud to uh, report that we achieved two um, pieces of very important uh, regulatory work. One was to um, an assessment of the value of solar on average, and we were looking at it from a system perspective, meaning relative to what it costs to buy power at wholesale in New England. And what we determined was that the average value of solar is 0.092 kilowatt hours, um, cents per kilowatt hours. Uh, it's, a, it's a point of reference, I think, that's useful to have in mind as we look at beneficial electrification and uh, have the ability to quantify some of our policies so we can make good judgments about where to put more money, where perhaps to ship money. Um, another tool that we created that I've been very excited about is a model that we were able to produce after we were able to hire somebody who's got these kinds of skills. Um, this model allows us to compare the relative cost of carbon reduction measures. And that's a very helpful thing to have when you're trying to make judgments, about, again, about what the policy emphasis. It's not sufficiently granular to where it could help um, a residential homeowner decide whether to buy an EV as opposed to do motorization as a means of reducing carbon. But at a policy crafting level, it gets at that. And I, I believe Director McNamara is going to be coming in to talk to you folks about uh, yeah, energy matters. Um, and he would be the good. person to follow up with on that. It's very, very interesting work, and I think timely. In the energy efficiency realm, we have completed the updates that are required in three years of the um, residential and the building, um, commercial building codes. Very, um, it, was, it was a rough uh, road, I think, as Senator McDonald will recall that. Um, I think there were some overhangs from years before about how the department was completing those updates by rule, and we got that ironed out so that our process and the format for it is now comporting with, uh, with laws we know it to be. Um, 
We also launched a thermal clearinghouse website this summer. Um, this is a, one, of the, one of the visions that I have for the department is that it be a place where folks from all walks uh, feel confident about going to get information about energy issues, energy measures they can take, and the like. So this is a, a clearinghouse that gives you practical information about measures that you can take in your home, for instance, to weatherize and the like. Um, it's, it, it calls it like you see it, it isn't uh, spinning toward one program or one particular philosophy about energy efficiency or another. And um, this is uh, you know, really good stuff from my point of view. It, it goes to the core of our public information and education mission. It's something that um, the department does well when the access is put there. Um, we also completed several program evaluations that are core that we do as a matter of statute, um, but they are also you know, they're, they're, they, they form the basis of uh, policy arguments that we make and advocacy for the PUC. So in that sense, they're substantive and they're ever-changing. One of the uh, very important studies that we com completed was the efficiency potential study. This is the study that says, OK, in the period of time before us, the next three years, five years, whatever it is, uh, how much uh, efficiency can uh, EBT realistically and with reasonable measures realize? And for many years, the state has been uh, engaging in policies that puts a lot of money toward that through the energy efficiency charge. This is good work. It's produced a lot of really good results. There does come a point when things mature, though. And so we've been looking at that. And the conclusion of the um, efficiency potential study was that um, reasonably achievable program potential is no longer increasing in the electric sector. And that's not a bad thing. It's, it means that efficiency policy in Vermont has been very successful. But it's important to keep in mind, it's not ever increasing. We've plateaued. At least that's what this study shows. And it's an important data point for you to consider because weatherization is such a big topic right now. And so a legitimate question to ask is, do we need to continue putting even more money into energy efficiency, electric efficiency? Or is there a point where we perhaps cap what we're doing and put money elsewhere? The people to talk to about that would be uh, T.J. Poor and his staff. They're coming in next week as well mm -hmm. and can give you more granular um, explanation of what it so. We also um, went through Efficiency Vermont and Vermont Gas's weatherization programs, and we audited and determined that uh, for EVT, the program savings, I want to be clear about this. This is not criticism. It's not indictment, anything of the sort. It's a, it's a math exercise that proofs the uh, data that comes in. And according to our uh, audit, we were able to confirm 65% of the savings that EBT had uh, claimed through its weatherization program and 85%. Uh, and for Vermont Gas, they were 85% less than claimed. So what this means is that the, the processes need to be calibrated or recalibrated, and that's what we've been doing uh, since you left town. Um, it's an important finding. It's not a bad finding, but it's an important finding. Um, Please, please. Yeah, sure, I understand the finding yes. that for Vermont Gas claimed to have made a certain amount of savings yes. and your they result was 85% less. less than what they claimed. Correct. And for efficiency Vermont again? 65% less. 65% yes. less than what they claimed. Or did we they were 65% of what was claimed. Okay, okay. what well, was claimed. Okay. And is that true for Vermont Gas? No. No. 85% no. less. Uh, right, the language is not symmetrical. Got it. But in the first instance, it's 65% of what was said. And in Vermont Gas's case, it was 85% less. Now, so that be the same. Your confirmation, though, when you say, let's say, 65% uh, of what was claimed, was it that they didn't do the remainder based on your audit, or that you just there was simply no evidence to support it? It's, uh, it's neither. Um, and this is why I've qualified the statement. These um, assessments of savings, they are based on professional judgments mm -hmm. and assumptions that are made by the practitioners. Mm -hmm. and so when EBT gives you a savings estimate or, or it calculates a savings, it has done so using perfectly valid methodologies but making assumptions mm -hmm. that are necessary in order to do that kind of um, reckoning, if you will. At the department, uh, our folks follow the same processes, but they make different judgments. And so it can happen that the two are all closed, and that's why we have the calibration in order to come to a shared understanding of how the savings should be measured. And I think that's an issue we've had since yes. day one, is yes. the reliability 
when you start assessing home efficiency and stuff is we just haven't been at it long enough to have a formula, and, you know, enough information to say yes, this saves X. It, right, it's just yeah. it's not measurable. In a, in what we what we intuitively want is a measuring stick that we could take and say this is how much uh, weatherization, how much fuel is saved, or right. how much energy is saved. But the um, the discipline, if you will, doesn't lend itself to that kind of measurement. It's, a, it's necessarily a question of modeling, derivation, assumptions, calculations. Well, you're going to assume that you're going to insulate my house and I'm going to keep the heat at 60 because that's where I've kept it. Yeah. If I turn the heat up to 70 because I've been freezing for years, I'm getting old and I get cold. I'm not going to comment on that. I know. <laughs> um, my yes. grandmother used to turn it up to 80 and then open the window when she got hot. Um, anyway, uh, so that's why. But I'm, I mean, that those are assumptions that you know you assume you won't do use your dryer more than you will. Well, if it's costing you less, maybe you will use the dryer more than you did. Yeah, on a granular yeah. level, I think you're absolutely on yeah. the right track. Yes. Okay. And, and the 65 percent that's only in their weatherization rules. Correct. Cost. It's just a weatherization. So I would encourage you again to um, to ask these questions of uh, Director Core if I get further questions. As if I, give, I would want the takeaway to be that this is nothing to be alarmed about. It's something to know about and to understand that the department. This is why you have the department regularly doing these verification exercises, and this is what we determined in this last period. Of time. I'm just accused of letting industry run the state. So I guess in this case, we've got the department to help us. There you go. <laughs> Ask the questions, but industry may not be telling us everything. That, in a nutshell, is what we do. That's right. <laughs> uh, we also reestablished the starting convening building energy labeling working group um, meetings. Also very important because that's the cohesive work by which uh, we interface with stakeholders, the industry, but also folks who are not part of the industry, in order to come to a uh, consensus, if possible, as to what building energy labeling should be like. Um, very helpful if we're going to move forward in that direction. And uh, we've also just uh, started again on this three-year cycle for uh, investigating the EEU budgets and their targets, which are the, that, that is in EEU, in an energy efficiency world, the equivalent of what a electric utility does by virtue of existing as a business and having service to render to its known uh, rate payer base and uh, calculating the cost of service and then setting rates except uh, you know, they, their only target, if you will, is to provide adequate, safe, reliable energy on that system basis. In the energy efficiency world, uh, there is more uh, predictive and design work that goes into saying, okay, what should EBT be trying to do? What should their targets be for the next foreseeable period? Because they're not actually delivering, their, their, their mission isn't defined the way electric utilities is. Um, moving to the telecom sector, <laughs> we have successfully rolled out the Broadband Innovation Grant Program. Yes, we did. Just a question about Vermont Gas. Yes. Because that's the, the one you, the weatherization in Vermont Gas is based on a carbon tax, isn't it? Carbon tax? It, it, it charges, it has an energy efficiency charge they have for energy weatherization efficiency. that is placed on the purchase of how much um, Natural gas, carbon, you you use. So Is I, that I, I, I'm not sure I can agree with that characterization. Here's how I understand. Where they, where does Vermont Gas get its money from? Right. To do weatherization. Right. So Vermont Gas uh, first has its rate case, and then it also exists as an efficiency utility mm -hmm. for gas purposes. And they levy a gas charge the way electric utilities. I mean, excuse me, an efficiency charge the way electric utilities <coughs> levy an efficiency charge. So the efficiency charge monies that they raise specifically for natural gas service, and that is paid by natural gas customers, that is the money they use for their weatherization programs. Yes. So yes. that answers your question. So the EC the more natural gas you use, the more. Or it would be an NGE mm -hmm. charge, correct? Um, and is it volumetric? Is what you're asking? And yes, the answer is to that. Yes. yes. And for the electric utility, the charges on the electricity you use, Correct, regardless of whether it's carbon or, or uh, 
or hydro pump ag. It's a very interesting. It's very. It's a very interesting point that you're raising because uh, we call it electricity and we don't give it an, another thought. But you're quite right. Underlying electricity is generation, and many forms of generation are carbon based. Not all, but many. For instance, as you say, uh, if it's natural gas generation, that's or if it's carbon. oil, exactly, that's carbon. That's correct. But if it's solar, for instance, or by law we define hydropower as clean and renewable, so that's not carbon. But physically, it's not carbon anyway. Yes. Uh, you said you did some work on a metric around solar or value of solar. Yes. Did you do that for wind or any other no. solar producer? It was. I think it was power producer. Done in the net metering context, and as you know, net metering is almost overwhelmingly solar in the state. Um, to be absolutely certain about the answer to your question, I would uh, ask you to return to that with uh, Director McNamara, okay. and he'll be able to take. Yeah, I think we're there's definitely we, we've got standard offer coming in, and we're going to be working right. in the whole system. Um, so moving back into the telecom space, we have um, rolled out the broadband innovation grant program. We have uh, one round of grants already. They went to um, the Wyndham Regional Planning Commission, uh, Newberry, and to CV Fiber. We will have a second round going out. Uh, it is actually out right now, as I think about it. And we have a third round that will go out after town meeting. This is the money that was set aside in, uh, was it 513, uh, last session for planning purposes. Um, we've had a lot of great interest. We had more applicants for the first round of grants than we could provide funding. And we also discovered that um, the applicants need help yeah. in putting their bids together. And so we've been uh, doing help, everything we can to help them put a stronger bid together. And instrumental in this has been the fact that our telecom division is now fully staffed. Um, when I was sitting here this time last year, we yes. had a director of one person. Yes. <laughs> it's a, I think, it's, didn't we authorize or put money Yes. in last year for an assistant. Yeah, yeah. We, we have one new position that does the broadband coordinating. And if you've followed the media on this, uh, there's a lot of interest uh, in two areas of the state in formal communication union districts. Um, that is directly a function of the work we've been able to do uh, using that position in the division. But even apart from that, uh, we had three other, uh, two or three other vacancies, I two. two other vacancies. So uh, a division that was down to director and one staff is now a director and four staff, and it makes a big difference. So, okay. We've also um, gone through the poll attachment rule adoption. Um, <coughs> the department had filed a petition a while back to um, <coughs> modernize and, and make it easier uh, the poll attachment process for the PUC. Uh, the PUC is in the final stage, I think, of adopting that rule now. And um, it, the, the takeaways from that is there's now one touch for make ready, which is long overdue. That means that uh, you, can, you, you roll the trucks once mm -hmm. to get the job done. And secondly, there's self-help in there now so that um, an entity such as EC Fiber can um, resort to self-help measures to get the job done if need be. Uh, if they've gone through the process and for a variety of reasons, um, it's taking longer than it should. Um, not everything EC Fiber wanted got into their rule, but the lion's share. Yeah, I'm very pleased with that. Um, we also completed the electric broadband feasibility study. Uh, which was a, a big piece of work too that came out of that. The, data. the upshot of that was that um, there still remains a one solution does not fit all for the electric utilities. And that is consistent with things that we've uh, testified to here in the past. Uh, there are also significant capital uh, investment. Um, uh, the, Investments that have to be made. Uh, one estimate in the study is $284 million below the capital. That doesn't call, um, cover operation costs in the bank. And the other thing to keep in mind about that number is it's not like you could take $284 million and make an investment and get the job done, but rather it's the aggregate of what it would cost for the utilities in their respective territories to complete the investment. So it's a, it's a round number, but you have to look behind it. When you look behind it, there's complexity. The good news is for at least one, possibly two utilities, uh, there's some there there. And so they're looking into it. And uh, something that was very, there are two things that I took away from the study that were very encouraging. One is we learned a lot about uh, funding that's available at the federal level. Uh, some of it we knew about, others we didn't. And um, the second that I thought was very encouraging is this legislature has um, 
has taken steps to uh, empower local communities to help themselves with connectivity uh, through the VITA program and the like. And I took the study results to mean that we're heading in the right direction, that that's, that's the way to go to get some of this work done. Uh, I'm excited about the federal funding um, aspects of it because that is consistent with the direction I've been taking for some time in taking this argument to the federal level and in fact I'm going to be in the in, uh, in February to discuss um, uh, Terrell Fry's more recent decision to shut down the mobility fund too that had um, several, um, that had like $4.2 billion I think of funding available for uh, wireless mobility and shut that down and just decided to put that money toward uh, 5G instead. And I'm going down to DC to explain to his staff that this is, this is I understand why they might make a, de a policy decision like that, but it's got serious implications for the rural parts of states like Vermont, where uh, 5G is, is just not where we're going to get now. We need connectivity for them. So I just had a session on 5G. Did you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, and we'll probably have more. I think this is an area where the state of Vermont has been missing in talking to commissioners down in D.C. Um, I've been doing that with FERC, and from that I learned that, um, yeah, there's no harm in knocking on the door of the FCC and saying, hey, this is what the real world implications are of your decisions in case we consider. Good. That's good. I think, oh, there's one other thing I wanted to leave with the committee. I think it's important for you to know this. Uh, last year was the year of horrible budget problems for the department. Yes. And the legislature was very good about reaching across and helping us fix that. And so you authorized an increase in the gross receipts tax, and you also <coughs> authorized the institution of signing fees for the department and the PUC. Um, I just wanted to give you an update on where we are on that. We do not yet know what the full impact of raising the gross receipts tax will be. We'll know that at the end of the fiscal year. Um, but we do have data that indicates that for the signing fees, when we had projected we would realize something in the input of $187,000, we uh, are on track to make about $140,000 from signing. Um, the good news from my perspective is that if everything goes right, if there are no unexpected expenditures that are not budgeted for, we might close the end with a small surplus in the neighborhood. Uh, so we're going in the right direction. Yeah, it would be good for building, um, you know, for other strategic purposes at the department. Um, order one has been stabilizing its finances, and it looks like we're pulling that off. So I'll catch you. Yeah, you have a telecom plan you're working on. What's the new status with that? Yes, uh, we are working on that. Just a dollar. <laughs> there you go. Um, I, I took to heart everything I heard in this room last year, no question. We put out a request for information this summer uh, to see what it would cost to retain uh, experts in this area to do a plan that tracks with Act 79 and not just the <coughs> requirements that were in statute before the session, but also the new ones. Uh, the range that came back to us was something in the neighborhood of the, uh, I would say, $250,000 and up. That was for one consultant. And I think the highest was uh, 800 grand for the other consultant. So that was the range, 250 to 800. I may have my numbers slightly wrong, but that's, uh, that's fair. Okay. Um, as I just said, um, I'll be lucky if I close the year out with 100K surplus. And uh, paying for an external consultant was not in my budget. So that's going to be an interesting. Um, uh, Is there any chance? I know there's a budget adjustment act in process that. I, I, I'm still in progress. I know I've talked to some of you about the letter that uh, I will be sending to you under um, Act 79 to let you know that we don't have the requisite resources. Um, I'm still turning over every rock and knocking on every door to make sure that that's the case before I send you that letter. What is that do? Is January <coughs> the letter? The, the letter, in my memory, is that it's due whenever I determine that I don't have the resources. Well, as a practical matter, if you don't have the resources and we have asked you to do a plan, yeah. uh, unless there's a measure to get resources, you can't do the plan. You can't meet the objective. I think that's fair. And in terms of just looking at when you get money, so things like the Budget Adjustment Act is the appropriate place. Is there, has there any thought uh, been given oh. to 
And what, what, what are you going to do? Because time is running out. Um, what I can say today is I'm aware of that. And it's been considered in my mind. And uh, as I said, I'm still knocking on doors and turning over box. And when will you be able to tell us what you're going to do? Certainly. And whether or not you're going to have the funding, whether it be the budget that's back or otherwise to do it. Certainly before the end of January. Before the end of January? Yes. Along, along those lines, if we were to find money in budget adjustments, is that become is that something you would be willing to use? You know what I mean? I, I get that sometimes the administration doesn't want to ask for money, but it, they said it's a priority for us. If we you know, give you the funding, is, is it possible that would sort of help? With At this that? juncture in time, yes. And, and to be absolutely clear, you asked whether you're willing and the answer is yes. Yeah. There's something called the Telecommunications Advisory Board. Are you familiar with them? Uh, the Connectivity Advisory Board? Yes. Yes, I am. And uh, how, are they involved at all in this planning process? Or should, are they supposed to be? Um, by statute, no. Um, my memory is that this came up at a meeting um, last Friday, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't see any reason why there can't, in, in theory at least, there can't be appropriate discussion. One of the issues that we come across is many of the members of the board are also folks who would likely be recipients or like to apply for recipients of funding in order to do their build outs and the like. And mm -hmm. so, uh, conflict of interest. yeah, exactly. But the telecom plan itself is, um, yeah, that's a, it's a planning document that's more of a discussion about how the world ought to be. And mm -hmm. it seems to me that that is, is another stakeholder that the department can certainly consult with. But the law right now, as it stands, doesn't um, require that. I know there's some advocates who are uh, suggesting that the telecommunications plan be taken away from the public service department yes. and sent to the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Do you have any perspective or thoughts on that? Um, well. I'm, I'm really hoping to draw a line under last year. Uh, I, Senator, I recall sitting in this room during my confirmation hearing and um, having a difficult <coughs> time. I, I think you asked me how to grade myself, and I gave myself an F. And by the time I was done talking, I had averaged it out to a C. Um, I will tell you candidly, that was painful for me because, in my heart of hearts, while I feel personally that I'm never adequate to anything. My work as commissioner, I think, has been very solid. And that the plan that we did did not satisfy the legislature. The laws were passed to uh, give us additional work to do, and I'm happy to do that. You will have no uh, fight for me on that. But I think we did a good job with the 2018 plan. And I'm very confident we're going to do a good job with the 2020 plan. And so in that sense, I very much um, I would advise against that obligation to transfer the system to the right place. Well, you have given clear instruction. Is it, is it correct then that in the event that you do not have the funds to hire someone outside, the department will produce the plan and will produce it on time? Certainly. Yeah. You have my, you have my mm -hmm. ironclad commitment on that. And it was never my intent to do anything else. OK. I, I'm going to have to wrap this up because we're getting next. So I want to finish up the question, send us Pearson and then send us Rodkin. Because we've got lots of folks uh, is there, is there coming in either this week or next week to go into more detail. Is there an update on the, uh, an update on the broadband leader proposals? Um, I'd want to get into specifically, and I'm happy to do that, what the specific data is, but there uh, has been at least one loan that I'm aware of that has been processed and approved. And I, I have very high hopes for that program. So everything I've seen so far looks really good. So we can get a specific answer. And we'll have, we can have Vita in to talk to us. We just had, a, before you talked about any with the revenue forecast, and his report notices the telephone property tax continues to decline. Does that come, does that touch on your department? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? The telephone property tax, which is a declining source of revenue, and he, he 
blames it on statutory clarifications are needed in terms of how we uh, utilities devalue, I guess, their assets. I see. So uh, is I would that say that's not de in depreciate, excuse me. Is that, 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 yeah, no. It, I mean, not, it affects the utilities right. that we regulate, but it's not um, a, a topic of jurisdiction that I regulate. Okay. Okay. That I will say that. that the declining revenue piece, uh, I can second that. Absolutely. Does that lead to funding for the department, or does that just go to the... I don't think that piece does. Where the declining revenue in that sector does lead to funding issues is in this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we've got right. tax department coming. So. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Please Thank you. be in touch if there's anything in the world. Well, we thought we did. This was just an initial. Hi, how are you? What's been going on? It sounds like a lot. Um, we'll get into more detail. It's 